If you would, uh, could you stand, if you're able, for the reading of God's Word? It's going to be two verses today out of the, the 10th chapter of Hebrews, verses 23 and 24. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. This is the word of the Lord. Have a seat. Thanks be to the Lord. You pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for your word. Lord, I think oftentimes we just take for granted the wonderful reality, God, that we get to experience revelation from you through your word. Lord, in this moment, we can oftentimes miss the fact that your spirit is revealing truth to our hearts. That you, Father God, are in control and that you have a word for us. And because you are God and because your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, you are constantly by your word working in our hearts, God. Lord, pray that you would just continue to soften our hearts to listen to your word. I pray, Lord, that we would be a people that as we listen, we would not just hear, but we would listen. Listening meaning we're responding and as James says, we would not merely listen to the word and deceive ourselves, but that we would do what it says, God. So God, we invite you this morning once again. We know you're speaking. We invite you, Lord, to open up the eyes of our hearts to see what you have for us. And we give this time to you. And we love you. Lord, may you continue to shift our focus from in to out. In your name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh boy, I got a music stand that doesn't like to stay up. It's going to be fun. All right, so this morning we are, we are finishing up our three-week series called Revision. And basically, this is normally a vision series to kind of pump us up for the fall and all of our small groups and all just a reminder as a church about what we're all about and, and where we're going. And this year we felt, you know what? Vision is great, but this is the year of revision. And so as we think about vision, we're thinking about what that looks like in 2020 about how the Lord is constantly revising our hearts and our ways and how they're always higher and better and stronger. Isn't Pastor Doug awesome? Look at that. And, and, how, and, and, and as we've been thinking about this idea of revision, we've been saying week after week, with all the things happening in our society, all of the voices that we're seeing on social media and in the news, all of the conversations that we're having at the workplace, all of the thoughts going in our head, the music that we listen to, the television shows that we watch, all of the voices that are speaking into us as a church, as Christians, we believe in this principle that our revision must be by the work, word, and work of God alone. It must be by the work and word of God alone. We will not allow anything else to revise us beyond God himself. 
And so the first week we talked about how, as we've been looking at this passage in Hebrews, that we are a disciplined people that are disciplined to be together wherever. And this word discipline means that we are working at it. And the point of discipline is not the discipline, but what discipline does which allows you to do things that you could not yet do. And so we understand as God's people that we are called to gather together, but we're learning in 2020 that the way that we gather is, can be revised. We can gather together wherever, whether you're watching online, you're with us. Whether we're outside in our cars on Mother's Day, we're together. Whether we're here in the sanctuary or under the tents and, and with all the ants, we are together. And then last week we looked at this principle in Hebrews 10 where the author of Hebrews is telling us as God's people, because of who Jesus is, that we are called to draw near. And this idea of drawing near, we've connected to the word devoted, devotion, priorities. And we thought about how as a people, Many of us in our society in different ways are finding ourselves in isolation, dealing with loneliness, dealing with all sorts of new challenges in 2020. And our response must be to draw near. To draw near, to have a devotion to the better way. The better way, maybe even better, the best way is always Jesus Christ. It's always the person and work of Jesus. It's better than your phone. It's better than Netflix. I know there's a lot of good stuff on Netflix. It's even better than your best friend. He is always the better way, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. And so we must be a people that instead of running in isolation, running from God in isolation to other things. We are a people that run to him. And so we talked about practicing solitude and silence and listening to the voice of God. And so today, as we continue to think about this, this third revision that I want to focus on is that we are a determined, we are determined to reach out wherever we are. We are determined to reach out wherever we are. 2020 has taught us a lot about programs being shut down. It once was that we would have this facilities full with all sorts of different programs going on and, and, and youth groups and children's ministry and Bible studies and, and all sorts of meetings here. And over this, the course of this year, we've had to reevaluate about how we reach out. But we do know that we're called to reach out. And it seems to me here in this passage that we're learning about this this call for God's people to reach out. And so I want to, as we look at this, I want to share with you just some insights from this passage that, that Mike read to us as we think about this transition from in to out. Because the honest answer for many of us when we think about outreach, when we think about reaching out, is our default response is always in. Our default response is always to take care of ourselves first, to bunker up, to put up the walls, to protect. But it seems here that there's something that happens in the heart of God's people that shifts them from in to out. And I want to show you how this transition happens and how it happens naturally and spiritually here. So a couple comments on this. As we look at this text, it's, you, you can see here the author of Hebrews is saying, let us hold fast to our confession. Confession here, maybe you're wondering, what does this mean? Well, I would define confession as, as Christians, the confession, the declaration that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. That's the confession. 
Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. This is why whenever you see us doing a, a baptism or a dedication or new members or ordination in our denomination, this is the question that we will ask. This is the confession as Christians that we hold on to, that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And the author here is he's thinking about all that's going on and in the book of Hebrews, the context here is there's persecution, is there's distraction, is there's plenty of reasons to let go. There's plenty of forces saying, let go. Focus on yourself, protect yourself. And here is he's urging the church, he's urging us to declare together, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and to hold fast to that confession. But we also see in this text this idea of holding fast as an implicit assumption that we can struggle with our confession. That we can struggle with our confession. The idea of hold fast without wavering suggests that there is a struggle. And what I'd like you to think about as you think about this truth is to, is to reflect on this confession. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And for many of us, when we think about this confession, we may be good with two of the three pieces of this confession. But to truly hold fast to our confession when we say Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior is to believe that and to confess that with all that you are completely, radically, 100%. So the first thing is you are saying Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus. And that's just not his first and his last name. That is who he is, Jesus Christ, the God-man, our Savior. So I am saying my confession is that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I'm not saying that religion is. I'm not saying that any of my works are. I'm not saying that anything else is. I'm making a declaration about a person, Jesus. Some of us struggle with that. Some people struggle with the declaration that Jesus is the only way, truth, and life. But for Christians, we believe that he is the only way, truth, and life. Or maybe you struggle with Jesus Christ is my Lord. I'm okay with Savior. I get that. But Lord saying his ways, his plans as my king of dictating to me how I will go, of submitting to his ways that don't always align to the ways of this world. They don't always align to the to the desires of my heart, I'll submit a little bit, but I struggle with completely saying, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Or for some, we struggle with Jesus Christ is my Savior. I don't really need a Savior. I kind of got this figured out. I'm, I'm good with Jesus, but he can just be my friend. He can just be like my counselor. Maybe, maybe my, my, my little guru who, who gives me advice every once in a while, but I don't really need a savior. I just need just some, someone to kind of help me get better, help me be more successful. And as Christians, we believe that we are in a position of needing a savior because of the three-letter word sin, because we are fallen in desperate need of a savior. So Paul, or not Paul, the author of Hebrews, maybe Paul, the author of Hebrews is telling us we hold fast to this confession. And as we hold fast, hear this, we also recognize not only that we can struggle with our confession, that Jesus never wavered. That Jesus never fell. And we see this throughout Hebrews. As we study Hebrews, it's all about the fact that Jesus is the better way. And as we think about this, I just love this. I love this little 
few words here as he is re- encouraging you and I to hold fast to our confession. For many of us, we could, say, we could say, oh man, I haven't held fast. I've let the Lord down again. I, I have forgotten that he's my Savior. Or, or man, I've not been doing enough. I haven't been reading my Bible enough. Or I haven't been joining into a, a small group. Or I haven't been reaching out enough. And, and as The author here is reading this. He wants us to understand that Jesus is king, that he is the one who works, that the gospel is about him, and he is always the better way. So then he says here in verse 22, it'll probably be in the right chapter, he says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Hear this, for he who promised is faithful. He who promised is faithful. This language here is that even when you feel like you are wavering, even when you feel like you have let God down, Jesus is faithful. And the point is that he will never let go of you. Brothers and sisters, you cannot let go because he will never let go of you. That is the hope he's talking about when he says, let us hold fast the hope. He does not say, we've said this time and time again, let us hold fast to the wish. It's not subjective, it's objective. We can count on it. It is assurance, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance. So we hold fast to this. And in light of that, in light of that confession, he says this. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. In light of that confession, there has, is something that happens in our hearts, something that happens in our minds, something that happens in the way that we see the world that shifts us from being an inward-focused people to an outward-focused people. We see a cultural shift from in to out to love outwardly and good works. Now, maybe as you're listening to this, you're asking this question, Logan, we just spent a lot of time in Galatians and we constantly talked about how you do not add on to Jesus. It's all about what he's done. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. So why are you all of a sudden talking about good works? Go listen to your sermons again, Logan. How do good works Doing good, how does that relate to our faith? I thought that it is by grace that you're saved. How how is there this call then for God's people to love? I think this is really important for us to understand. And as we think about this, as we think about what it means to be a determined people, I use the word determined because I want us once again to understand that there's effort that happens, that it is a struggle the shift from in to out. But as we think about this, as we think about this process of letting our confession do something in us to go from in to out, I want to read to you 1 John as we think about what it means to love others. And I I want us to understand together how works, how love connects to our confession. And I think John helps us with this in 1 John chapter 4. He says this, 1 John chapter 4 verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. Let us stir up one another to love and good works. For love is from God, and whoever loves God has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. It seems to be that when we receive this love from God, it does something in us that naturally causes us to love others. How? In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. 
In this is love, as we think about love, as you think about how to love others, capture this picture. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the payment for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Do you see the connection of God's love and our love for others? As you think about this, as we together think about what it takes as God's people to have this transition, this shift from an inward focus to an outward focus, as we think about what it means to be determined, we must remember the reason for the determination. See here, brothers and sisters, friends, family, we are determined to reach out wherever we are because Jesus reached into where we were. Because Jesus reached into where we were. I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see. I was an old creation, but in Christ, I am a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So if you are in Christ, you will love others. That is who you are. That is the outworking of your salvation. It is the actual work of the very Spirit of God in you. This is what he's talking about. This is why in James, as he's thinking about this idea of faith and works, he says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. In Corinthians, it talks about, let us examine ourselves. And so our works do not save us, but as we examine our lives, we should recognize that the gospel, the story of Jesus in our lives, should produce work. And if I look at my life, and if I look at my priorities, and if I look at the things that I'm doing, and I don't see work, it may not be about evaluating the things that I do, but it may be about evaluating the confession that I make. And maybe asking myself, have I truly embraced Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Have I confessed this? Have I put my faith in him? And if I have not, do it now, right now in this moment. If I have, I hold on without wavering because he who promised is faithful and he's doing work in you and stirring up work in you, stirring up love in you. It will happen. It is happening. You are probably just unaware because your good works are not about your good works. They're about the work of God. It's not about doing them for your own glory. It's about doing them for the glory of God. And so church, as we think about this, we recognize that we are a people that confess this. And it starts with the confession that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. And out of this, as God continues to change our hearts and change our minds, we can't help but love and good works. It's a natural thing. And so church, as we think about this, I'd like to talk about three mantras to help us shift from in to out. Three mantras to help us shift from this inward focus to this outward focus, to be more obedient to God's spirit and to, be more, to, to, to continue to embrace who we are as a church, as a people that stir each other up to love and good works. This word stir up is a word in Greek, as it was originally written, about stimulating. 
There's a bit of an edge to this word. This isn't like sitting around in a circle singing kumbaya and, and, and all having a box of Kleenex and crying over each other. And, and there might be some of that, but it's also sometimes speaking into each other and saying, hey, you got more to do. Spurring each other on. It's that locker room talk. And as we think about this, these mantras, I want to encourage you in three different ways that we are going to declare. Three different sayings or mantras that we declare together to help us in this shift from in to out. The first is this, we give God the glory in our story. We give God the glory in our story. In other words, look at what God did. I truly believe, church, that as we hold fast to our confession, people are going to start asking questions. Why? I'm so afraid. Why are you so confident? I'm so anxious. Why do you have so much peace? How could you smile in the midst of this prognosis, in the midst of this loss of this dear one. How could you keep saying that God is faithful when it seems that everything around you is falling apart? How could you do this? Thing? How could you love in that way? And we say, look at what God did. Look at what God did. And it always starts with sharing our own story about what God has done in us. Your best way of shining is your story. God has gifted you with that incredible truth of thinking through how God has called you from death to life. Jesus himself, our king, said this in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. And then what happens when they see your good works? Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Church, when our default is inward and somebody comes up to you and says, Pastor Logan, that sermon was awesome. Says to me, really enjoyed that. Response could be, yeah, I'm awesome. That's not God's people. If the sermon was powerful, it was the Spirit of God that worked and not me. If people leave thinking that anything is exalted besides Jesus, I've lost the opportunity to give him the glory. And so the response should be, to God be the glory. And as we think about this, when people gush over the love and good works, we constantly redirect that to its source, which is Jesus Christ, which is God the Father the Holy Spirit, and we give him the glory. And so as people ask, we say it's all about God. Look at what God has done. As we tell other stories, we say look at what God has done. So we have this mantra of giving God the glory, but also church. We must be a people that ask, remember this word, one another, about how we are reaching out. We must ask one another how we are reaching out. Maybe a question in our small groups or, or in our community groups or at lunch today. What has God been doing in your life? This is this determination. This is this intentionality because our default, our flesh, is going to want to make it about me. So as a community, the way that we stir each other up is we think about how we can reach out how we can stir each other up and how we can, as we look and think about our community, how different people are gifted and how can I encourage them and spur them on and how can they encourage me and spur me on to love and good works? Because friends, this is so important. 
When we think about the words of Jesus, the commands of Jesus, the solid rock on which we stand, our cornerstone, our name, as we build on that, building on that brings about works. Jesus talked about this in his parable. He said, everyone then who hears these words of mine, the words that we're hearing today, and does them will be like a wise man who has built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat on that house. Has anyone felt that at all this year? But it did not fall. Because it has been founded on the rock, or as the author of Hebrews would say, because he who promised is faithful. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell. And the floods came. And the winds blew and beat against the house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. It goes back to this theme of as we think about our response, is our response drawing near and devotion to Jesus, our solid rock. And as we think about how we stir each other on, we think and we look to lift each other up and support each other. I'm thinking of Eliza right here, sitting next to me, signing to our, our friends in the deaf community. I would say two, three years ago, we were having a conversation like this at the Emerald Palace, that's Scott Donegan's pool. And we were having conversations about how God has gifted us and what, what are our talents and what are our desires, how has God used us for different ways. And Eliza started sharing with me about, how, about her gifting in sign language. We said, well, what if we started doing that in church? We said, but we don't have anyone here. We said, well, if the God has put it on our heart, he'll bring people. And that was two and a half years ago. And we started doing it two and a half years ago. And there needed to be some st stirring up, some building up. And then just months ago, Eliza had a conversation with Denise, who, who is uh, the leader, uh, one, the secretary for, our, for our, our deaf brothers and sisters, and they were looking for a place to gather because of COVID. And they happened to have a conversation at a garage sale. And now we have our brothers and sisters worshiping with us because of, of, of God stirring up in Eliza and, and, and in me and saying, Let, let's do this. Let's stir each other up. I think of my brother Ron in the kitchen. I think of, uh, of, of the conversations that we had when we thought about shutting down our kitchen on Wednesday nights. And we said, but people are still hungry. And he said, well, what if we do a drive through And I think of that first Wednesday, we thought, well, let's make spaghetti because that'll go a long way and there's probably going to be 100 people. And all of a sudden, they started lining up and we had five, 600 people and we didn't have enough spaghetti. So I had to go to Save Mart and I, and I had to, to buy all their spaghetti and they, they thought that I was being selfish because you're only allowed to have a certain amount of spaghetti per family. And I had to say, it's not for me, it's for everybody else. And the spaghetti had to be this, this like, vegan or, or it, was, it was nasty spaghetti. <laughs> but we fed everybody. We covered it in sauce and it was totally fine. And then we started to learn and we started to grow because God was stirring up in Ron and our elders and our people to say, God, you've done something in us. We must respond. We must feed the poor. We must care for the orphan. We must, we must lift up families. This is why we started talking about as a church. No, let's keep going. Listen, this is why as a church we've been saying there's this ache in our hearts 
for our community and our schools and, and kids that are at home and, and families that are in Zoom and families that, that cannot go to school and kids that don't have a safe place. And so Cindy comes to me and says, well, what if we open up our facilities for families to come and, and study here at Cornerstone? And I said, I don't know. How about we, how about we email the, the leaders here in the district? And we had a conversations. And next thing you know, we got Ken Tharp leading. We have 10, 20 kids eventually coming here and studying using our Wi-Fi and, and getting loved on by our church and going to school here even though they can't be in person. They kind of still are in person because that's love and good works. I think of all the conversations, this, this ache in my heart as a pastor of not being able to connect with God's people but then having phone calls and when I talk to somebody they say, oh yeah, I've already talked to like four or five people from the church because they're checking on me. I think of a conversation with our sister Nina Heffington who, who, who's, been lo- who's been locked up in Merced. I've got to visit with her yesterday and she's sharing of our elders and our, and our family who has been calling her and loving on her and then she shares with me, well, God's God given me a mission, Pastor Logan. What's the mission? Well, there's this lady that I know in memory care and I know her and I am going to find her and be light to her. And I'm going to be her friend even if she doesn't know who I am. There's no reason. There's no excuse to say, well, I'm too old. I don't know enough. No, the Spirit of God is calling us as a people because of our confession, church, to respond in love and good works. And as you think about this, remember it's not even about you. It's about following Jesus. If you wonder, well, what would Jesus do? Let's look at what he did. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. It says this, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease. In every affliction, do we not need healing of disease and affliction today? Then he said to his disciples, hear this, church. Farmers, you are all in the midst of a harvest time. He says this, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to send out laborers into the harvest. I imagine those prayers are Catholic prayers. I use the word Catholic because that references the church in all times, in all places. So I imagine as the church has been praying for that, I imagine the disciples praying for you and me in this moment. I imagine Jesus praying, Lord, Father, empower by your Spirit the church to love and good works. So as we ask these questions, I want to encourage you to think about this. I want to encourage you to listen and ask yourself, what is the Spirit of God calling me to do? How has he gifted me towards love and good works? Maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's starting to text message or send notes to people, maybe it's helping out with some of the different programs we have. We always need help in our kitchen with the, with the meals. We, we Actually, if you could, maybe pray about helping out with the Zoom studies. If you're, if you're in education, we, we could really use that. Maybe it's helping finance some of this. Maybe we, we started a, a, a new fund, a fire relief fund that we're starting, you could go online and you could just give to the fires and we're, we're, we'll use that money to bless and, 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 and support those that have lost their fires. I don't even, or lost their homes or, or are displaced. Maybe it's a matter of giving away financially or maybe it's a matter of giving money to the schools or whatever that may be. Whatever God is speaking into you. 
And church, I want you to catch this vision. I want you to imagine with me as we think about this revision that we're talking about. Imagine with me. Could you just close your eyes with me for a second and imagine that we are a people. And as we begin the book of Hebrews, imagine tomorrow when we start reading Hebrews that we are all reading the Word of God together. And we're in our reading plans together and we're every day drawing near and encouraging one another to draw near and we're reading the same text together and working through that together and then we're in groups. And when questions rise up or when storms hit, We have people that are praying for us. We have people that are thinking about us. We have people that are walking through struggles with us. And as we do that, as we are disciplined to meet together and we come here on Sundays or watch online, and every week I guarantee you, you're gonna hear and be reminded of the gospel. You're gonna hear and be reminded that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and you will be stirred up. We will be stirred up by the gospel, and because of that, that will produce love and good works in us. We believe that. We believe the Spirit of God is active and is moving and is doing something in us. We believe that revival happens by His Spirit. That revival happens through God's work. But hear this, revival happens by the gospel. It happens by the gospel. It happens by people confessing that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Cornerstone is not your Lord and Savior. You are not the Lord and Savior, so we point to the Lord and Savior, and we share our Lord and Savior. And as we do that, can you picture with me what will happen in our community? Can you picture with me Jesus saying, light shining in darkness? This is what we're about, church. And if you say this is your church, this is what you're called to. This is what we're called to. And you may say, the Spirit is God is is stirring up in me something that's not being done. I'd like to encourage you. I think the Spirit of God is telling you to do that. I think the Spirit of God is telling you to take on a mantle of leadership and to do that. Hear this not to email Pastor Logan and say, we should do that. Or more practically, you should do that. But to say, God has stirred this up in me. How can I do this? And then let's talk about that. Talk about this as a family. And church, as we think about this together on this wonderful, glorious Lord's Day, as we reflect on the gospel together that Jesus Christ is our cornerstone, as we remember that our confession is in the object of our faith is a person, a person who who dwelt among us, who came down, manifest himself, and became man, lived a perfect life, was full of compassion and humility and loved all around him and spoke truth and then died for you and me so that we could live. As we think about that, may that flow out. So I just want to pray together and then I want to do the best we can do, which is to sing a song that confesses our hope. Not to sing a song that says, let's go and change the world. We don't do that. God does that. So the best response we can do is to say, Jesus Christ, my solid rock, is the one that I stand on. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Jesus, you are our Lord and Savior. You are the light that shines in darkness. You are the redeemer. You are the one who has adopted us into your family. You are the one who does the work. Your kingdom work is by your power. We invite you and look forward to how you will work. And God, I pray right now, I believe your spirit is stirring us up. Your spirit, Heavenly Father, is calling us to love and good works. 
But Lord, we recognize, God, that the only way that our works are good is if they are done out of an outflow of your spirit and your gospel. If our works are any sort of pride or selfish ambition or anything for our own glory, we recognize those are not good works, God. You are the source of all things good. So I pray, Lord, that you would continue to stir us up. I pray, Lord, that as we sing together about you being our solid rock, and at the end of this song, as we declare the words of mighty to save and say, shine your light, the whole world see. God, would you let your light shine in these broken vessels? Lord, would you let your light shine through the cracks of these broken vessels? Spirit, would you speak in ways that do something in our hearts. God, move and work. We invite you here. We confess of our disbelief at times, but we also confess that he who promised is faithful, and we look forward to seeing how you will work. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory in your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray together. Amen.